Bible reading plan, we began the Gospel of Mark. And today I want us to look at uh, the Gospel of Mark. And we're looking at Mark chapter 4, uh, where Jesus is sharing truth. I want to read just a few verses to begin with, so our text. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. And again he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables. You know, society has not always looked on the teaching profession with great favour. In times past, some saw the position of teacher as associated with servant class. And this concept is not far removed from this fourth chapter of Mark. Jesus, as God's servant, shares four basic truths with his followers. He led them to see the basic principles of sowing and reaping. And you see that in, in verses 3 to 20. Then we see the principle of revelation in verses 21 to 25, and the principle of growing in verses 26 to 29, and the principle of, of expansion in verses 30 to 32. The first two verses of this chapter, which I have just read, prepare the reader for these teachings. And there's four elements that are found in the introductory verse. The servant is at work. And we see Jesus here, he taught and, and then we see there's a surge of people, the great multitude. Then a systematic approach is made by parables. And a subject of study is given his doctrines. So first we see the principle of sowing and reaping. In Mark chapter 4, 3 to 20, we see the seed... And we see in verse 3 that the seed is the same. We read, listen, behold a sower went out to sow. And the implication in this passage is that the farmer used the identical seed in different locations. God's word is the seed. It is the same no matter where it is presented. Then we see soil, and we see in verse 5 that the soil is different. It says, some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprung up because it had no depth of earth. Then in verse 7, and some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And then verse 8, but other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced, some 30-fold, some 60 and some 100. Mark lists the places where the soil differed. Every human heart is different. Yet the same Holy Spirit appeals to all. We see Satan is at work in, in verse 15. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Though Satan is at work universally, some hearts are more easily conquered than others. But those hearts that have been given over to the growth of God's seed, the word of God, cannot be touched by Satan. Those who receive that word and abide in that word, Satan cannot touch them. We see the saviour the savior reaps the benefits in verse 20. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit. 
some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. Two things happen when God's word is allowed to grow in the heart. First of all, the individual receives a special blessing. And secondly, the Lord gets the honor and the glory. Hallelujah. So we get a blessing. The blessings of God overflow. And the Lord gets the honor and the glory. We, our lives bring honor and glory to God as that seed it, it begins to bear fruit. Then there's the, as I said, the second principle, the principle of revelation. We, we, we see the, 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 the parable of, of the light under a basket in verses 21, 25. God purposes to reveal. When God created light, he didn't expect it to go unrevealed. Neither is the gospel to go unnoticed. God's plan calls for revelation. In verse 21 we read, Also he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bread? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? The light must be revealed for all to see. You see, Satan tries to conceal. Satan will always be at odds with God. He encourages believers to place their candles under baskets. He doesn't want our light to shine. He doesn't want our light to affect or be seen by others. But truth must come out. In verse 22 we read, For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. The nature of truth makes it impossible to keep hidden. It will be revealed despite human efforts. We see people's destiny determined in verses 23 to 25. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. People's destiny is determined by the way they respond to truths. And God's truth is personified in the person of Jesus Christ. You want to know truth? Then get to know Jesus. He is that personification of God's truth. Consequently, people's future is determined by their response to Christ. So he is truth. And so our future is determined by how we respond to him, the one who is truth. The third principle is the principle of growth. And we see that in, in, in the same chapter, Mark 4, verses 26 to 29. The parable of the growing seed. You see the sowing of the seed in verse 26. It's a, it's a similar il illustration is used to teach another truth. The principle of spiritual growth is the lesson that's at hand here. And he said... The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. You, say, you see sleeping of the man. He says, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. The fact is mentioned that even humans go to sleep. They are, are inactive. Growth continues. God is not dependent on people to bring the increase. We see 
the springing of the seed, the, the, the process of growth appears insignificant at first. But finally, multiplication of seed and effort is realized. In verse 28, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. Then there's the securing of the crop in verse 29. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. No profit is made from any crop until the reaping takes place. This comes at the harvest and only God can designate the time of harvest. And then we've got the fourth principle, the, the principle of expansion. And that's in Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 33. And there we see the parable of the mustard seed. You know, Jesus is teaching great truths here. And he wants his disciples, the hearers, to, to grasp the truths that he's teaching them. So... It's sown in significance. The, the entire chapter uses agricultural experiences to, to proclaim spiritual truth. A third scene of sowing is used to illustrate yet another truth. A very small seed is planted in verses 30 to 31. Then he said, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all seeds on the earth. And in verse 32, we read, But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs. The shoots, it shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may rest under its shade. Godly expansion, we see nature brings about a vast expansion of the original seed. That's what God's all about, expansion. And there is no way to compare the seed and its fruit. You see this tiny seed and then it goes into the ground, it dies, it germinates, it begins to, to grow, it shoots forth and it grows and it matures and becomes a great tree. And then you get the fruit that comes out of that seed. Then it speaks of a, a place of security. This growth is used by birds as a place of safety and shelter. So not only do we get fruit, but the tree becomes a place of, of safety and shelter for birds. God can take feeble human efforts and expand them to great usefulness. There's no telling what God can do or what God will do with what we give to him, little becomes much in the master's hand. As that, that, that little seed goes in the ground, that that seed seems so insignificant, yet within that seed is great significance. When that seed begins to grow and matures and, and it becomes established, it's no longer an insignificant seed. It becomes a significant tree and a tree of tremendous usefulness because it, it expands. God wants to take our lives as we receive the, receive the truths of Jesus, as we receive him who is, is truth, and as we take that word by faith and use that word, apply it to our lives, put it in the, in the soil of our lives and let the word grow. There's no telling what God will do. His light will shine forth from our lives. Expansion will come. Good soil, that word will find. And 
the light will shine forth. You know, all these parables, Jesus explained to his disciples the purposes of God. And if we can just take heed and allow ourselves to lay a hold of that truth and apply that truth to our life, there's no telling what God will do with our lives and in our lives and through our lives that he will get all the glory. And as I can conclude, after giving private instruction in Mark 4.34, but without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. And using a graphic illustration in verses 35 to 39, Jesus caused his followers to search for truth by faith. We read about the winds and the waves that obey Jesus. This is on, on that, the same day that when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said, to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him. He caused his followers to search for truth by faith. And this is seen in the question, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? We need to search for truth. Jesus is the truth. And as we seek for him with all of our heart, we will find him. That experience in that boat, when Jesus had finished his teaching, went asleep, Using the stern, he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him. They were afraid. They were terrified. They thought that they were going to die. But in the midst of this storm, in the midst of the boisterous wind and, and threshing waves, he was at peace. But in the situation, in the negativity of the situation, in the intensity of the situation, he wanted them to teach, he wanted to teach them a truth. He wanted to give them a revelation of who he was. He wanted them to start to question and to, to seek to know who he was. And he just stood up and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so 
fearful. How is it that you have no faith? Listen, what's happening in our lives and our world today can seem like that boisterous wind, threshing waves. It can, it can seem like our little ship is going to be capsized and, and we're going to lose it all. We're going to lose our lives in, in, in the storm, in the hurricanes of life. I want you to understand, if we receive Jesus Christ, who is the personification of God's truth, who is truth itself, and he abides in us, and we abide in him, then his peace is going to garrison our lives. And he is going to captain our ship. And we're not going under for going over. We're going to reach the other side. And he's speaking peace right now. He's saying, peace be still in every situation in our lives. No matter what's happened around us in the world, I want you to understand God is in control. He's in our boat. And he's not flustered. He's not frustrated. He's not fearful. Because he knows who he is. And we need to know who he is. He's the master of the wind. He's the master of the storm. He's the master of everything. And everything has to be silenced at the sound of his voice. As he said, peace, be still. The wind ceased immediately and there was a great calm. Not just a calm. Mark says, a great calm. And then he addresses those in the, the boat with him. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? We need to have faith and we need to have faith in Jesus, which will deal with the fear in our lives. And it says, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? The storm was one thing. But it was another thing for a man to stand up and speak to the elements and the elements obey. The question that came to their minds, the question that they asked each other, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him, cause them to begin their journey to seek to know who Jesus was. Today we know he is the truth. And here he was sharing the truth to these people. Lord, help us not to be fearful, but to trust you. You are truth itself. You are our place of safety. We are living in a very disturbing world. We're living in a very troubling world. It seems that everything that can be shaken is being shaken. But those who have the truth, those whom your word has been established in, no matter what happens, no matter what the enemy brings, 
no matter what circumstances throw at us, we will stand the test. We shall not be moved because we are grounded in you, the living word who is the truth. Thank you because you're with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you because in you we have the victory and we shall successfully cross over to the other side. Amen. Saints reaching the Lord.